Families, week six of 12, vertical versus horizontal relationships. Make sure that things are good. Okay. Um, I, since the last semester, I've kind of changed what I focus on here. But uh, before we really get into that, I just want to throw out there that uh, our podcasts, we are recording this, recording the audio. Uh, the podcast will be available on Christian Radio, ChristianLivingRadio.com, uh, Spotify, and iHeartRadio in a week or so. So that's pretty cool. Our website is BlendedFamiliesMinistry.org. Uh, as in most ministries, uh, if we're helping you, a donation would definitely be appreciated. Uh, but this is about vertical versus horizontal relationships. I think most everybody knows the difference between vertical and horizontal, but just in case, this is vertical, <laughs> this is horizontal, okay? Um, I like to start with 1 John 1, 3 through 10, there's quite a bit there. Verses 3, 7, and 9 kind of tell you what a good vertical relationship is like, you know, being a follower of Christ and being honest and truthful and loving and those kind of things and 6, 8, and 10 basically explain how sin disrupts your horizontal relationships and you know if, if there's lying or you know any of those kind of things in there your horizontal relationships are not going to be very good so that's a good place to start there um, Normally I go into a bunch of stuff about trust and faith and different things like that, but I've kind of tweaked this to where I'm talking more about your identity in Christ. That's the heart of the vertical relationship. So <clears throat> something that a lot of people don't realize is that you're a volunteer in God's army. When you become a Christian, you enlisted. <clears throat> You're not a draftee. You know, they didn't pull your number out of a, a hat and go, okay, now you're in the army. You know, that's the way it was back in, in the 70s. They just picked the number, and if that was your number, you were in. Uh, so once you volunteer to be in God's army, then you are expected to go on missions, which are your good works, right? We are saved not by good works, but for good works to increase the kingdom of God. So, as a Christian, we have a job to do. You know, you, you enlist in the army, or the whatever military branch, they give you a job. They expect you to do some stuff, not just go to mess hall. <laughs> okay. Now, the vertical is based on faith. Um... You can't really have a vertical without that. And one thing, I put it down here, but we are saved by grace alone, by faith alone, through Christ alone. Mm -hmm. Right? There's nothing we can do. We can't earn it. We can't buy it. We can't find it. We can just believe it. And all the work has already been done on the cross through God's grace. And it's through our faith in that work that Christ did that we have that eternal and abundant life. But it's got to be in him. Uh, one of the things that I know through our years of counseling people really struggle with is, you know, the, there's a scripture, and I, somebody knows the chapter and verse, shout it out, because I don't remember what it is. Uh, but you are a new creation in Christ. When you give your life to Christ, you become a new creation. First Corinthians five seventeen. Was it? First Corinthians five seventeen. Yeah, that sounds right. <laughs> Good. First Corinthians five seventeen. I should have that memorized. I love that one. <laughs> you are a new creation. The old has 
died and the new has begun, right? Now, a new creation has no past. And, and this is the, the spiritual warfare thing that we talk about all the time. Because it's really a battle between our past and our future. You know, we're, we're spiritual beings trying to figure out how to be human. Mm -hmm. We're eternal beings trying to figure out how to be human. We are going to spend eternity somewhere. And, you know, we, we have to make a decision somewhere along the line where we want to end up. Mm -hmm. and, and the default is hell. Right? This little uh, line thing here kind of describes that. So we, we start out, we're born, and we're born into the bloodline of Adam. Mm -hmm. We're all sinners. No one is good. No, not one. Right? Somewhere in Romans, I think. But that's, that's the default. We're born into that bloodline of Adam. We just stay there unless we change bloodlines. So somewhere down the road, we give our life to Christ. Now we become part of his bloodline. And that bloodline gets us into heaven. But we've got to be in that bloodline. Uh, I know there's various discussions about you know, once saved, always saved, you know, those kind of things. To me, it's if you're truly saved, that's really where the question is. Are you truly, truly, truly giving your life over to Christ? Then it's like you can fall down on the ark, but you're not going to fall overboard. You're still on the ark. You know, there's all kind of things on the deck. Slip and fall. But you're still on the boat. Okay, um, but the, the truth of the matter is, did you really give your life to Christ? Because that's when there's a transformation. You know, you, you understand what God has done for you. You realize what you have been, and you don't want to be that anymore. You want to be something different. And so you truly give your life to Christ. You know, there's the parable of the different soils, the, the good soil, the rocky soil, the really hard soil, you know. So, yeah, a lot of people say, yeah, okay, I'll take that, and then nothing happens. Well, there was no con uh, conversion, if you will. But there's, you know, somewhere you got to make the choice. But the default is you're, you, you start out in Adam's bloodline, you stay in his. Okay, new creation, no past. I think a lot of people have a problem because you, we don't forget our past. Mm -hmm. It's still in our head. We know what we've done. Mm -hmm. We know what happened to us, mm -hmm. right? It's still there. Mm -hmm. But what do we do with it? That's the key. Now, the other scripture I like really well is there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Mm -hmm. So once you give your life to Christ, whatever that was you did or whatever happened to you, there's no condemnation for that. Mm -hmm. So between these two scriptures, there is a whole lot of freedom. Mm -hmm. This is where the freedom is. Getting, you know, grasping this concept that I am no longer what I have been. I am something new. And I know all the bad stuff that I did or has happened to me, but there's no condemnation for that. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm free to go. The, the jail door is open. Mm -hmm. You can leave. But you have to walk out. You can't just stay in there with the door open, right? Satan uses your past to kill, steal, and destroy. He, he will try to kill you, steal your joy, destroy whatever blessings God has bestowed on you. But it's based on what he knows that you've done, right? Satan is the accuser of your past. He has no idea what your future is. He can't accuse you of anything you haven't done yet. Right? Now, if you look at this, okay, it's kind of like the other one. You, you start out, you're a sinner, and somewhere there's a salvation experience, and that's where your past is behind you, and your future is ahead. But Satan is all in the past, and God is in the future. God gives us a future and a hope. Now, becoming the Christian 
like he said, we are not saved by good works, but we are saved for good works. Mm -hmm. It's about your behavior going forward. What kind of choices are you going to make? Because you behave based on your beliefs. Now, the, the couple that used to teach our Beyond Divorce class, he had something that's like, do you believe that what you believe is really real? Think about that. <laughs> it sounds kind of weird, but do you believe what you believe is real? Okay, because if you really don't, you're not going to behave according to what you what you know. Right? You can know stuff, but you may not believe it. So there's a difference between what you know is true versus what you believe is true. You know things and you believe things. Right? So the big thing for today is who am I versus what am I? Most of us are more concerned about what am I, not so much who am I. But that's, that's really the, the question you all need to ask yourself today is who am I versus what am I? I always thought I was pretty good. You know, I tried to be good. And then there was a point where I don't want to be good anymore. I chose to be bad. Well, then I didn't want to be that anymore. I didn't want to be the rest of my life what I had done, mm -hmm. right? And that's really this one here. Uh, if you give your life to Christ, you're a new creation. I'm like, okay, sign me up. Because mm -hmm. that, that, just hearing that, like, freed me from what I'd done. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay, so that's, that's old news. That's buried. That's gone. Mm -hmm. I don't have to keep dragging that with me anymore. So who am I versus what am I? your identity in Christ, right? No condemnation. <clears throat> when, you, when your identity is in Christ, you know you're not being condemned for anything. You know your destiny. You know where you're going. <coughs> There's freedom in that. There's security in that. You know, I mean, what's the worst that anybody can do to you? They can send you to heaven. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, we don't want to leave here, but when we know where we're going, it's really not all that bad. You know, it's, it's bad for everybody else that's left behind, but hey, I mean, that's about as good as it gets, yeah. right? So, does, does this, I mean, is this revelation to anybody? Just seeing the difference that there's who and what. Satan wants you to know and keep, he keeps reminding you of what you are, right? He doesn't say anything about who you are. Because who you are is a child of God. And that's the last thing he wants you to get. Mm -hmm. Who I am relates to my spirit being. What I am relates to my earthly being, which is the body. Mm -hmm. It's two distinct True. different things. <clears throat> and Paul said it best. He said, it, I have harmed no man. Well, we know he killed a lot of people. <laughs> but yet his, he was so tied to his new creation, he could say, I have harmed no man. Right. So, if, I mean, there, it's been 15 years since I gave my life to Christ. So, I mean, I'm not green necessarily, but there's a whole lot for me to learn yet. Right. Hopefully. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. So, getting some basic concepts, that's why I kind of wanted to do it this way instead mm -hmm. of the way I used to do it, is the basic concept of understanding the difference between your identity in Christ versus your identity with the things that you have done or what happened. Mm -hmm. right. Because like that little diagram, the past is what Satan keeps accusing you of. Mm -hmm. Remember that thing you did? Remember this? Remember that? Remember when that person did that to you? You know, all that kind of stuff. He just keeps throwing, throwing it in your face. Mm -hmm. Jeremiah 29, 11, God knows the thoughts he has towards you, and they're for good, not for evil, and to give you a future and a hope. Yeah, um, <clears throat> that who I am, think about how Satan tempted Jesus, and that was one of the things, if you are the Son of God. 
He already knew who he was. Who oh, he right. Because, some, like you said, he's not going to say who you are. But he tempted Jesus to do something he knew was violating God's word and mm-hmm. law. And that's what he does to us. He tempts us because our pastor's teaching on that right now about the Lord's Prayer and about lead us not into temptation. Mm-hmm. He wants to lead you in temptation, and then he's the first one to accuse you. Right. See what you did, see what you did, <laughs> see what you did, and condemn exactly. you. Exactly, yeah. He'll tempt you to sin, and then he's, as soon as you do it, he starts accusing you of it. Yes. And he wants to, Satan wants to pin your sin to your forehead. Yes. Right. And, and define you as that. Exactly. And, and we try to redefine who you are by yeah. what you did. Exactly. It's, it's all about your identity. What do you believe mm-hmm. about you? Mm-hmm. Right? Um, there, there's just so much freedom in realizing that your past is really irrelevant. Yeah, it's, it's your history. Mm-hmm. It, I don't want to say it defines you, but it, it creates your normal mm-hmm. that we've talked about in the past. But your normal is not your future. It's just everything that's, you know, it's the sum total of everything that you've lived through up to this point. And uh, then on this one, you are transformed by the renewing of your mind. So your normal up to today is is going to be transformed into a Christ-like normal from here on out. So whenever, right? So... Know who you are in Christ because there's you don't have to worry about your past. Now, there's all kind of people out there that are used as tools by the enemy that'll they'll be the ones throwing your past in your face mm-hmm. at with Satan's help, right? But you are transformed by the renewing of your mind. So as you renew your mind, okay. God says, here's what I am. Here's who I am, right? This is what God tells me about me. Mm -hmm. I'm loved. I'm going to spend eternity with him. There's nothing that is so bad that he would turn his back on me. You know, those kind of things. Like Karen said, Satan is constantly throwing your... He'll he'll get you to do something wrong and then just throw it in your face Mm -hmm. over and over and over again if you let him. But we have the power through the Holy Spirit to resist those. Karen. And that's the beauty of salvation. You know, the Lord says that I remember your sins no more. Right. And if God doesn't remember our sins, who are we to be remembering them or reminding God of them? Once we repent, confess, I mean, we do got to do our part. Once we confess and repent. He forgives us. He says he remembers them no more. So if we keep remembering them or allowing the enemy to keep bringing them to our mind, that's not God. No. That's him. That's the enemy. That's the enemy keeping us tied to our past, right? Now, if I'm tied to this board here, I can't reach my coffee. I got to let go of my past to be able to get my future coffee. (laughs) Um, Now, uh, that brings up a a good point that Karen just mentioned. There's a process when when your vertical is interrupted by sin, and, you know, we we still sin, but it's covered. It's already paid for, right? And we don't have to worry about the condemnation from, from it. But you have, there's, well, usually God's up here, you're, you're down here. So, I threw it backwards. Anyway, whenever there's a sin in here, it puts a blockade in the vertical. Now, Karen just mentioned, there's a process we have to go through to get re- get that restored. And it's <coughs> confessing the sin, repenting, which is changing my mind and how I look at that thing. And then I, I receive God's forgiveness because when I confess, he is faithful to forgive, right? But then there's another thing. We have to forgive ourselves or whoever did something to us, right? 
I got a whole nother chapter on just forgiveness. We'll get into all that later. But. So any kind of a sin puts a blockade in here. Uh, I like the way Karen put it. It's like a blood clot, right? You got the blood flowing here. And it's everything is good. And then there's a blood clot, you know. And you got to get rid of that to get the blood flowing again. And that's how we do this is... Uh, and, and Psalms 51 is like the road map. It's, it's right after uh, King David had messed up with Bathsheba. He wrote this psalm. And it, it really just lays out the process. You know, he, here's everything he did to restore his vertical. He, he humbled himself. He got on the, on the floor, face down on the floor, and he just cried out to God, you know, God... Against you and you alone have I sinned. He owned it. All right? Now, he was trying to get away with it before he was <laughs> confronted. And, you know, he wanted to kill the guy that was doing all this stuff. And they, oh, you're the guy. Oh, busted. And that's when he got on the floor. So, but if you look at Psalm 51, um, uh, just real quick. It says, Have mercy on me, O God, because of your unfailing love, because of your great compassion, blot out the stain of my sins. Right? So it's like it never happened. That's what we need to remember. When we confess, when we're faithful to confess, God is faithful to forgive. And God forgets. Hallelujah. So it's like it never happened. But we know it happened. We don't have that ability to forget. Not like God does, anyway. Um, wash me clean from my guilt. So when we sin, there's guilt that comes with that. Wash me clean from my guilt. Purify me from my sin. For I recognize my rebellion. He owned it. He didn't... Well, that, that woman there... It's all her fault. She was taking a bath naked on the roof. So, you know, he owned it. And that's a big part of the process is identifying what you've done, confessing it, and owning it. For I recognize my rebellion. It haunts me day and night. Now, sometimes we'll talk about the difference between being sorry I got caught and godly sorrow. This is godly sorrow. It haunts me day and night. Against you and you alone have I sinned. I have done what is evil in your sight. You will be proved right in what you say, and your judgment against me is just. For I was born a sinner. Uh, you know, just from, from day one, he was a sinner. Purify me from my sins, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. So he, he understands this renewal process. But I'm not going to read the whole thing here, but if, if you go through it, you'll see the steps that David had to go through and the understanding that he had of who God was to be able to cleanse him from his unrighteousness. <clears throat> And one of the other things is to restore his uh, joy of salvation. So there, there's just a lot of stuff there. If, if, and, you know, it's not if, it's when there's a problem with your vertical. That's okay. God's like, I'm here. I'm not up here with a fly swatter to smack you when you mess up. I'm here. I got my arms out. I want to give you a hug. You know, it's how do you see God? on the throne with a fly swatter or a hammer or with his arms out wanting to give you a hug That's how do a big, you think big that? difference between Adam's response because Adam said that was the woman she oh, gave, yeah. gave you was her well, see that that's there's a good that's a good yeah good description between you know, the two's response yeah well he he first blamed God <clears throat> well that that woman you gave me <laughs> she made me do it right <laughs> So, I mean, there are two things in there that he did wrong. I think, we'll never know, if he would have owned it and mm -hmm. confessed it and repented, God might have forgave him and we'd still all be good. Yep. 
Is it possible? Who knows? Okay, so <laughs> so much of the spiritual warfare thing that we deal with is in our mind. Th this is where the battle is. Because, you know, back when I was watching cartoons in black and white, there was always like a good and evil thing for the most part. And I have an angel over here on this little shoulder and the devil with a pitchfork over here. And they're, you know, they're both talking at the same time. Mm -hmm. Which one are you going to listen to? You have to pick it out. You have to discern the spirits. Mm -hmm. Which one are you listening to? It's like the, uh, the Native American thing with the two wolves. Mm -hmm. One's good, one's evil. Well, which one's going to win? The one you feed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? <laughs> it's the same kind of thing. Which, which spirit are you going to be listening to? So you are transformed by the renewing of your mind. Again, say... By grace alone, by faith alone, through Christ alone. Now, the other thing I want to get to before I get to the obtaining and maintain thing is if you go on YouTube, there's a whole bunch of videos about the tale of two trees. So check those out. But kind of the short version, there were, when Adam and Eve were in the garden, God said you can have eat of anything you want except for the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, the, the tree of life was there, and there was this other tree that was the knowledge of good and evil. So you can, have, you can eat of anything you want except that one. Well, okay, so Satan comes along, and he takes some fruit off of it and says, hey, check this out, Eve. Ooh, that looks pretty good. Hey, Adam, this is awesome. Uh, we're not supposed to do that, are we? <laughs> yeah, it's okay. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. And now here we are. But the thing that happened was the tree of life was the source of life. That was God. He was in that tree. Right? But because they ate of this other fruit that they weren't supposed to, it's the knowledge of good and evil. So I, I split it up this way because generally what most people do, they, they know they're evil, they try to get better. But all they're doing is getting, they just keep climbing higher in the same tree. It's still the wrong tree, right? You can try and try and try to be good or better, but you're still in the wrong tree. So... Sin is what got us all over here. So we're all in this tree until we accept Christ as our Lord and Savior, and that gets us back in the tree of life. And this is where we want to stay. Right? So check that out on YouTube sometime. It's, it's a really good story, and you know, there's some that are longer than others. There's a whole bunch of them out there. But it's, it's a little bit of a visual that gives us some, some idea of how we act here on planet Earth. Is we start out as evil, and we try to become better, some of us, some not so much. <laughs> we just, hey, this is cool, we'll just stay here. But a lot of us, you know, we, we understand there is good and evil now, and we want to be good. So we keep climbing higher and higher in the tree, but, I mean, there's only so far you can go in being good. But, like you said, you're still in the wrong tree. It doesn't matter how high up there you get, you're in the wrong one. So you got to get back in the other tree. And Jesus is the only way to get there. All right. So, I wanted to say some, add something about that. Yeah. When we're in that tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and those that climb higher... Kind of have a moral we look down our nose at those that are lesser mm -hmm. on the tree oh, yeah. and we think that we're better right the people that are up in the, in the top part of the tree judge these people sometimes they judge these people too <laughs> right but then so what you're still you're getting judged mm -hmm. right you are judged as you judge mm -hmm. others so just remember it's all about your identity who are you? 
Who cares what you've done? Only Satan. And the people that are following him. <laughs> right? Part of his mission for minions. Um, okay, so a vertical relationship is easy to obtain. You just accept Jesus. That's it. That's all you got to do. Some people think that's too easy. And that's a problem. It's like, surely, I mean, surely there's something I can do to earn it. You know, they, they don't feel right just taking it, right? The, it's a pride thing. You know, we want to be able to earn our salvation, and that's why G, uh, God did it the way he did it, because we would want to do that. Mm -hmm. He knew that. The, pride is a bad thing. But it's easy to obtain the vertical. The difficulty is in maintaining it. Because it's easy to accept it, and then you think, okay, i got to get out of hell free card. And then what? Well, there needs to be some good works, you know. You've volunteered to be in God's army now, so there's something that you're supposed to be doing besides just sitting there with the card. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and part of the problem, or no, I should say problem, part of the difficulty is the fact that we hate this word submission. Men have to submit to Christ. Women have it a little tougher. They have to submit to Christ and a husband. But we all got to submit to Christ first, right? But submission, if you break it down, is just a sub mission. It's a mission under another mission. That's all. And it's a military way of looking at it. You know, you're in the army now, you volunteered, and you're expected to go on missions with your good works to increase the kingdom of God. So you have, I mean, there's a whole bunch of missions. You got God's a 500 star general, and there's all these other executive <coughs> officers, and even the infantry and the foot soldiers, and everybody else, the cavalry, the cavalry, no, <laughs> cavalry. Um, but you have missions, and there are tasks that each person needs to do to complete a mission. So sometimes it's your mission. Sometimes it's your task as part of the mission. You know, like, our mission was to do this blended family ministry. But we need other people to do certain tasks to help us get the mission done. You know, we can do most of it, but we still need some help to get the whole thing done. So submission is not really that bad. It's, it's not easy because we just don't like doing it. It's, it's against our nature, and if we don't have the Holy Spirit in us to help us get there, uh, it's going to be a struggle. Just like in the army, some guys love that stuff, other guys hate it. You know, they, Every time they turn around, they're fighting the, the orders that they're supposed to do, especially in boot camp and stuff. And speaking of boot camp, once you give your life to Christ, there's a period of time, kind of like a boot camp, that God is working on you, but so is the enemy. Trying to convince you to quit. Mm -hmm. Right? So uh, the spiritual warfare really begins when you give your life to Christ. That's when the attacks start. Um, Galatians 5 has the works of the flesh, fruits of the spirit. It's always good to know what those are. Uh, in our book, uh, there's a page, I think, that has them all listed out. Uh, I suggest just making a copy of that page to get it on your refrigerator uh, just so you know it's one of the places you go the most right on the, <laughs> the fridge but just seeing it you know you don't have to sit there and read it every time just just it gets that image in your head and sooner or later you're, you're going to get a little conviction oh I'm on the wrong side of the list um, thinking something I shouldn't be thinking I need to get over on the other side and when you're operating in the fruits of the spirit then the Holy Spirit can convict you of what you're thinking in, improperly actually it's on page 72 Larry okay in the page 72 page in, the, 72. in the hymnal yep. <laughs> right. uh, like the family's book so 
when if you start getting that image of that page in your in the back of your mind, then you start seeing some of the behaviors that you're you may be doing. It's like, oh, you know, I'm really not supposed to be doing that. You know, Lord, help me get over on the other side where I belong. Um, let's see. Any. Um, you didn't, uh, emphasize on the difficult to maintain prayer and fasting. Oh yeah, I a lot of my time. started down that road and I found a rabbit trail. Uh, easy to obtain, difficult to maintain. The maintaining requires prayer and fasting. You look in Matthew chapter six; it it talks about you know what we call the Lord's prayer. Some people call it the disciples' prayer because they wanted to know how to pray. So. Christ showed them how they needed to pray. So it's either the Lord's Prayer or the Disciples' Prayer, whichever one you want to call it. But it takes time to maintain, and it's like pretty much anything. I mean, even a new car. It's easy, easy to obtain a car, but then you got to maintain it, or it falls apart after a while. You know, you can only go so long without changing the oil. <laughs> and then, and then, you're, then you have a, a big doorstop. But prayer and fasting, Jesus took time by himself. Every now and then he'd just get off by himself and he would spend time with his father. We need to do that. You know, a lot of people talk about a prayer closet. You know, y'all you, you, you seen the movie The War Room? She actually had a closet in the house where she went and prayed. And she put up scriptures or she put up people's name, pictures, and different things, and she'd be praying. And, about them or for them and, or against certain things. That was a prayer warrior, right? And, you know, not everybody's going to do that, but you need to spend time with the Father. And there are certain spiritual attacks that are more severe than others, and sometimes it takes fasting to get through, to get some kind of a breakthrough. You know, if you're looking for an answer for something and it's not coming, take a few days skip a couple of lunches or do something to where the time that you would be eating you're spending more time in prayer and just trying to get closer to God so it it does take work uh, it's pretty much like anything else it you get out of it what you put into it uh, so many people yeah I mean there's so many people that think well I'm an American so I'm a Christian well, you know, like they say, just because you stand in a garage doesn't mean you're a car. You have to do something to become a Christian, and then you have to do something to show you're a Christian, right? As it says, faith without works is dead. So if you're not, if somebody can't, see that you have given your life to Christ through how you behave? Are you a Christian? I don't know. you got to answer the question. So, But the vertical relationship has what to do with the horizontal layer? That well, part's not up there. It's... In order for the horizontal relationships that we have, which are the ones here, you know, human to human, if the vertical is not very good, the horizontal is not going to be very good. Again, that's why a lot of marriages are in trouble yeah. and relationships. Yeah, exactly. Um, I didn't put all this on the board, but uh, you know, for this class, we're mostly talking husband wife kind of stuff for horizontal well, future husband future wife. husbands mm -hmm. and wives, spouses. It, it's just human to human though it's any relationship uh, but especially for spouses here it's pray together daily do a date night weekly and these kind of things keep putting your priority pyramid back in order right if you're praying together daily you're working on your vertical uh, you're, if you're going out on date night, you're keeping the marriage 
up there at a very high level. And you're, when you go out on date night, you're showing your kids how important your marriage is, right? As well as any extended family that's out there, you know, they need to see that your marriage is important, more important than they are, right? And then obviously the, the job and career and ministry is after the family. But that praying together daily and date night reinforce the pyramid so that things stay in the right priority. Uh, don't be speaking evil about each other or anybody else. Uh, when there's sin involved, when there's a break in the vertical here, communication breaks down. The thing about sin is, our, as in the garden, the first thing they, that somebody wants to do is hide it. Blame. And that, or blame somebody else, right? Yeah. I, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to touch that. I, yeah, I, okay, I messed up. But I don't want that. That's not me. So we try to hide, and then when we're hiding, we don't talk, mm -hmm. right? We're not as open with anybody, especially a spouse. Um, let's see. Yeah, go through this Psalm 51 process. Confess that. Get it out of the way, so that the communication flow can do better again and uh, you know, like the pyramid just keep your keep your spouse as your number one earthly relationship if you have one make sure that is the most important one you know a lot of people make the mistake of putting the kids before the spouse you know a lot of, there's been a lot of a couple two or three generations where that's kind of been the, the norm mm -hmm. is where well, we got to do everything we can for the kids, right? Mm -hmm. So the husband and the wife spend 18 years <coughs> taking care of kids first, and they don't do anything with each other. And we had <laughs> a couple many years ago where the lady was scared to death because yeah. her husband was about to retire. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she, didn't, she didn't know him. Right. They exactly. spent their whole lives taking care of their daughter. Yeah. The daughter was the number one focus. Mm -hmm. So now he was he there's this threat <laughs> of this man being in the house all day <laughs> was scaring her. Yeah, they'd been married she didn't, 32 years. She didn't know him. She, she didn't know him that well. Yeah. Right? So I, it's it's weird like that. But that's that's what happens when the kids are number one mm -hmm. and a spouse is number two, if that. <laughs> you know, <clears throat> could be number three or four if the job's in there and you know, some friends, and oh yeah, and then my husband, and her, my wife, and all that kind of stuff. So if, if the spouse is number one on the horizontal, okay, God's got to be number one on the vertical, spouse is number one on the horizontal, and then everything after that. Then things will go much better for you. But if you're putting kids before your spouse, or you're putting a spouse before God, it's not going to be so good. So, yeah. I mean, that can happen not only in a blended, but just a, a family Anybody. together. Because a lot of times, especially as women, we, we are nurturers. Mm -hmm. And so as women, we a lot of times we do focus our attention on our children because our children do need our attention for a, a time. But I like what right. you said, children are stewards. You know, we're just stewards of our children, if yeah. you remember that. But you can be so invested in your children, you forget to... to you know, maintain that couple relationship and you end up becoming strangers to each other because you mm -hmm. did not develop that that well, whole time. Right. So you were focusing, like you said, mostly on children. Well, you know, it's, it's like pretty much anything else. It, if you ignore something, it tends to, right, go away. Mm -hmm. right? Not maintaining if you're not spending the time with a relationship, I mean, it takes work, yes. right? And if you're not working on it, it, it falls apart, yeah. I was also um, just thinking when you were talking about nurturers, caregivers. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I take care of my 81-year-old mom and my special needs son. And if caregivers don't put in what they're being taken out, then they're going to be depleted and negative yeah. in their bank account. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I have to constantly refill my spiritual bank. Right. And if I don't, then I'm going to be completely depleted depleted and 
and my health itself will go down, and you see caregivers, their health goes down. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it's, we get filled from above, so we can pour out. If we're not getting filled, you know, we're going to be running on fumes, and then we're out of gas, right? So, yeah, you, especially if you're caring for someone, like, like a job kind of thing, then you got to get filled up somewhere. Because if, so, if you're taking care of somebody that's in ill health or something like that, you're constantly pouring out. Mm -hmm. And they, they got nothing to give. So it's not like you pour out some and then you pour back into me and it just keeps going back and forth. You got to get it this way because it's kind of a one way thing going out. And if it's not coming in, then you're going to be out of gas in no time. And uh, there was uh, one example of. Uh, a lot of people think when they get married that there's like this, this marriage box full of blessings and, you know, as they go through life, they're just going to take something out, right? Well, the truth is, when you get married, the box is there, but it's empty. Mm -hmm. You have to fill it up as you go so that you can take something out. If, if there's nothing in it to begin with. You have to keep it full. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Jerry. Two things. Uh, first, before new creation, I said First Corinthians. It's actually Second Corinthians, five seventeen. Right. And the five seventeen five, sounded right to me. Right. And second. Corinthians, but yeah, second. Okay. The Thanks. other thing that what we use as a marriage lesson is uh, uh, in the garden. If Eve would have said, "Well, let me check with Adam," in other words, oh, right. the husband and wife relationship mm -hmm. was yeah. in good order, she said, "Well, let me check with Adam." Yeah. And if Adam was on, then. Um, yeah, they, they we'd be here in a different form. <laughs> yeah. You know, and, and so she didn't. And Adam should say, well, let me check with God. Make yeah. sure I heard him right. Right. So there's the, the marriage relationship of keeping that. Mm -hmm. True. Very because good. the outside force was trying to come between and actually did. Mm -hmm. And here we are. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, she should have. Yeah. I mean, the order was given, right, to not eat that. Mm -hmm. and but he didn't relay it to Eve. Well, that's, yeah. Properly, at least. No, right. Well, not that she... But she said, yeah. She didn't believe it, I guess. But Part yeah. of the temptation, though, was, did God really say? Yeah. Right? Exactly. Well, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. right? So let me check with that. Yeah, let me check with that. Yeah, that was the thing. Well, yeah, yeah, I don't think he did say that. And then she just went for it. But, yeah, if she would have, well, let me check with Adam, and then Adam would have checked with God, they'd have been fine. Right, or and you know, like I said, if if Adam would have owned up mm -hmm. instead of blaming God and then blaming Eve, and yeah, you know, the, the things could have been a lot different too. But I don't he know. could have just and when Eve gave him the fruit, he could have just said, "Whoa, this ain't going, on, this ain't right." So I'm not doing it. Yeah. It wasn't until he partook that they were in unity with it, and that's when sin, because yeah. Eve didn't come to him with her, yeah. you know, covered up and all. Came still the way she was. Right. Once he partook, that's when they, they came in unity, and that's when, oh, uh oh, we're in trouble now. Right. <coughs> yeah, that, that's when they realized they were naked. And, Big thing about unity, yeah. Yeah, the thing is, they try to use a plant to cover <laughs> up. Guys, that's not, not good enough. Mm -hmm. Something has to die. Right. There has to be bloodshed to cover sin, even from them. So there's some kind of an animal that died to give up its skin so they could be covered. And the sacrifice was made to cover the sin as well, just cover them. What I find really remarkable in these illustrations is that Adam and Eve were direct creation of our Lord, and yet they were able to sin. We're so far descended, and we live in such a world that's darkness that I can sort of understand us sort of because a lot of us aren't trained properly to be able to discern mm -hmm. power when I think of Adam and Eve they're direct direct creation the first creation and yet they were able to sin and not have that discernment they hung around with God in his garden you think that they would have their influence was holy and good our influence is darkness Right. And my only conclusion and my only, I guess, uh, answer
answer to that is how, and I hate to say this, but how powerful Satan is because yet he was able to influence two direct creations of the Lord where they lived in a holy, you know, good place and yet how powerful he can be. And that's that's what free be will does for yes, you. And that should be a lesson to us to, to right. learn that and if they were able to, you know, move away and, and be tempted, how much easier Right. Well, you know, you, you take a step back from all that. God knew what was going to happen anyway. Mm -hmm. And he already had the plan for salvation in mind before any of that. Mm -hmm. Right. So it was part of the plan. We wonder why, why would he do that? But he did create them both with free will. Yeah. Right. That was the purpose. Which was part of the test. Right. <clears throat> so many things God does is like a test to see... Do you believe me? Are you going to do what I ask you to do? Are you going to do what I command you to do? Some things are commandments. Some things are just, it would be good for you if you did this. You know? But they had free will. So that that's all it took to be tempted to sin. And you know, like Karen said, even Jesus was tempted. But he always knew that it is written... You know, it's not about me, it's about the Father, so mm -hmm. I don't care what you say, it is written, mm -hmm. and get behind me, mm -hmm. right? And I think how powerful Jesus is that, you know, Adam and Eve didn't have all these thousands of centuries of sin, and we have, and how much more powerful Jesus is to, for anybody to be saved. Yeah. How much more powerful Jesus is to save someone like me and the rest of us in this room. His power is greater. Yeah. Well, we recommend that um, you do start praying together. If this is something new for you, you're in for quite a treat. Uh, for those that are listening, um, we even had a couple just this week that we counseled, and um, we suggested two weeks ago that they start doing that. And they'd been married over 20 years, and they'd never done that. And they said how much we really enjoy this. This is awesome. We've never done this before. And uh, we've had other couples that have been married a long time, and they've never done it. And they said, but my kids, what if my kids see me doing it? <laughs> well, how terrible would that be if the kids really see you praying? I mean, that would be a prayer in itself. Um, and even someone like Sarah, her mom, and I'm not saying that our mom's not saved, but if you do have somebody in your home that is older, and how powerful would that be for them to see you in prayer also? Um, so there's just so much more that God can reward you with when you do do what he, he is uh, actually asking you to do. You gotta be obedient. Pray to him daily, and when things are so out of control and you have a day because I get calls from girls all the time like this and you from guys you just don't know what kind of a day I've had it's terrible and what I tell the girls is just you need a time out you go in that prayer closet or you go uh, take a shower or sit in the tub make your cup of tea get your Bible out or a Joyce Meyer book or something like that that you can have your time alone and then at the end of that, you think of someone that you could help. Do something for someone else. When you reach out to help someone else, your problems are little. And we're all here to serve. Anyway, not be served. So when you, took, uh, you take everything out of content and put it like that, it just makes it a lot easier. And, uh, so I'm just saying prayer is so powerful and is necessary and is commanded, as Larry said, it is commanded. That's kind of all I had. One last thing, and then we'll wrap this up. I, I didn't put it on the board. I've said it in other classes. I didn't say it in this one, though. Again, going back to your identity in Christ versus what Satan wants to do, right? Satan knows your name, but calls you by your sin. All those things that you've done or those things that happened to you. That's what Satan calls you by. God knows your sin, but calls you by your name. He knows what you've done, but he knows who you are. 
And that's what he cares about. He really doesn't care what you've done because that's already been paid for. He, want, he has a destiny for you. He has a future. He's got a hope. He wants you to get there. Amen. Satan doesn't want you to get there. All right. All right. So again, it's uh, blendedfamiliesministry.org and christianlivingradio.com to, uh, uh, as well as iHeartRadio and Spotify for some of the uh, podcasts from the class. And that's going to wrap it up. Let's get together a closing prayer. And-